Very good. Now please know it's allowable in our Buddhist center every Friday evening and Saturday and Sunday to smile. And I say that because just a few things of meditators who were on the retreat which I was giving, giving over in uh, Thailand. Many of them had problems not with difficulties in their lives, depressions, uh, things not going wrong in their, their world. And they asked for simple pieces of advice to be more aware, more mindful, and more kind. And the first little exercise is something I've mentioned here often. And the reason I mention it is because it was told to me when I was a student. This young guy just uh, studying, playing around, going out at night and getting very tired. And sometimes things would go well in your life, sometimes it wouldn't go so well. How do you deal with all of that? Unfortunately, the meditation teacher I had at the time was very innovative. And what he taught me, he looked at me one day and said that you need to smile some more. It's a simple thing. And well, how? And he said, what do you do first thing in the morning? And I said, get up in the morning, go to the toilet. Yay! In the bathroom, is there a mirror? I said, of course there is. He said, what I want you to do every morning, and I followed the advice. It's one of some of the best advice. It saves you thousands of dollars from psychologists and therapists. He said, put your two fingers on the side of your mouth, in front of the mirror, and push up. Make a silly face at yourself in front of the mirror. And I did that for the first time. And then it worked so well. I continued doing that for two years without fail. Every morning I'd get up and look at myself in the mirror and make a funny face. And I started every morning laughing, no matter how I felt. Now that's so simple. And people think, no, that can't work. You know, that you've got to pay money to psychologists to make it work. And you can do it yourself for free, and it's very, very powerful. There's lots of stuff like that. You understand what kindness is. You can feel it. You're being kind to yourself. You're not so critical, giving yourself a break, giving yourself some space in life. You feel much better. And I don't know if I said this the last time I travel around so much. Even simple things, like you're playing a sport. You know the thing which I did when I was at Cambridge, a stupid thing to do, was I just joined the boat club. You know the Oxford versus Cambridge race? I never went to that level, but nevertheless, uh oh, the camera's not working. That's good, that means it's offline. Yay, I can say and do whatever I want. Scratch my head. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but whatever else is itchy. Okay, anyway, I'll fix it later on. But nevertheless, you can have audio. So whenever you have um, just a smile, that when I was rowing on the boats, the in those days, I had this coach who would be on a bicycle following you, giving you instructions. And the thing which he shouted out at me, my lay name at that time was Peter. I said, Peter, you're making an ugly face. And what's that got to do? Of course I'm making an ugly face. I'm pu pulling this oar as fast as I could. It hurts. And he said, smile. Simple thing. So I did. And the amazing thing happens, when you smile, it's much easier to pull the oar. Honestly, you had more energy. And it didn't hurt as much. 
So I don't know whatever you're doing in your life. You may be a bricklayer laying bricks. You may be some athlete running somewhere. You may be cleaning up. If you're just making some food, for goodness sake, smile when you're cooking. The food will taste better. Honestly. When I was over with uh, in Thailand, and most of the people who were on my retreat were Singaporeans. And they remembered one of these classic retreats which we had over in, used to use the North Perth Redemptorist Monastery. And I remember <laughs> one of the most amazing things which happened on that retreat, which I will never forget. Sunday morning, I was giving the morning talk at 8 o'clock, and then the, the local priest from the nearby church came running in and said, turn off your microphone, turn off your microphone. I wonder why. What had happened was that the, these were wireless microphones, and because they were wireless microphones, the frequency which we had was the same as the frequency they had in the church. So the priest's sermon didn't come out, but my sermon came out instead. So it was the first time in that church in the Redemptorist Monastery they heard a talk about Buddhist meditation. <laughs> and instead of sitting back and enjoying it, the priest said, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. And of course, what did we do? We laughed. We did turn it off. We thought it was so funny. You know, that's, it's not rid ridiculing people, it's just none intended and life can be enjoyable like that. It can be bring smiles onto your face, which brings up energy and actually good health as well. It's one of the reasons why that the kindness is such an easy thing to create in yourself. It's just a bit of a smile no matter what you're doing. And any of the kids at school, how many of you know how to smile when you're doing the exams at school. Try it. I did that. Final exams at Cambridge. Smiled in the afternoon. And it did really well. It should be obvious. When you're smiling, you get much more energy. When you're depressed and you're miserable, of course you lose energy. And your mind is not as engaged in what you're doing. Which is one of the reasons why that kindness and that joy, no matter what you're up to, really helps you be a successful person. Am I a successful monk? That's my career. And I think I'm pretty successful as a monk. It's a really strange thing to say. You let go of the world, but then the world comes chasing you. But nevertheless, that kindness to oneself, you learn and give that kindness to others. Even simple things, because I'm getting old now. Sometimes, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, you need to get up to go to the toilet. And just coming back from Thailand, you know, I wasn't sleeping well at night couple of nights I just got up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet when I went back to bed couldn't go to sleep again so I started getting tired only one or two days because then you understand what to do such a simple thing instead I just did get up in my cave crossed my legs and meditated just for half an hour or 45 minutes that relaxes your body and mind so much. I was being kind to my body. My body just come from overseas and it was tired, stressed by the flights or whatever. What I needed to do is give my little body a bit more kindness and then I could lay back on my mattress in my cave and then just wake up again at five. I just went and have a nice sleep afterwards. So, little things, how to relax your own body. Can you do that? Can you really be kind enough to your body, no matter what's happening in your life? Physical tiredness, 
sickness or difficulties in your life, things no, not going the way you expected, extra work, can you do that, lay down and just go to sleep? It's not that hard to do. Years ago when I went off to Sydney to the conference, I love conferences because I'm not always doing the talking. I do the listening as well and I learn more. I remember this one lady, she was a psychologist over in Sydney. She was teaching this guided meditation through the body with kindfulness, not just mindfulness, but the kindness. That's such an important ingredient. Without that, it's just like having fish without chips. Or, what <laughs> I don't know, I just love fish and chips. Or like having tea without condensed milk, without tinkering. <laughs> I don't know what else you like. Bread without butter or whatever. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just, you know, when they, the mindfulness and the kindness, they kind of go to get it, get together. They make it really work. They make it really warm and nourishing. And things, amazing things happen from kindfulness. And so when you, that's all she was teaching. She had an internet company. And she said she was making a fortune from Sydney. Her company, she's probably changed it now, was called sleeplikeababy.com. It worked. I've, I've undercut the market now for her, because I teach thousands of people exactly the same, all for free. But what it meant was you know how to relax the body, and you can sleep for goodness sake. You don't get worried, you don't get anxious. Now that's, now what's that got to do with the Eightfold Path, some people ask, because the talk I was going to give this evening, I always go off on tangents all over the place, but I love that. The talk I was going to give this evening, somebody emailed this evening, and they said, can you please give a talk more on kindness? Because you know sometimes when you look at the theory of Buddhism, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Dependent Origination, Satipatthana, all this really harsh, not harsh, it's good stuff, but sometimes it's hard. Where's the emotional quality in this? I think it's just sometimes the translations. They don't bring out the emotional beauty of meditation or wisdom. It is there. I often mention this whenever I talk in detail about Anapanasati. I mentioned it in passing here. Even when you're on the, the body experience, being aware of your body, being kindful to it, it starts to feel really beautiful. The mind does, because I've been doing this for much longer than most of you. My body just was, oh, it's really nice, really. Oh. Just like when you go home at night, you had a very busy day, you tuck yourself in in bed. Don't you feel cozy in bed? It's nice and warm. It's one of the softest places which I ever have to, to lay in. It's my bed, my lovely pillow, and it's just the right temperature. I mentioned this today to people. When I went to Thailand, it was very hot. When you come back to Perth, it's very cold. There must be some place in between which is just the right temperature. And for many of you, that place is always there for you, your bed. <laughs> You've got a sort of blanket on, a duvet on, it's really comfortable. It's one of the most delightful places you can actually be. Do you enjoy it? Is it one of the reasons why you don't like getting up in the morning? This is really nice and warm. This is really warm. I don't want to waste this. So <laughs> if that actually happens, it just shows you just the joy of relaxation. It's a pleasure. And if you make use of that pleasure in the beginning of the meditation, will your mind wander off anywhere? It will stay there. I told this to people over in Singapore. You guys, if you're watching a football match, do you have to put forth effort to watch the football match? Do you have to strive to watch the football match? 
or late, people who don't like football match to watch a movie. The latest, I don't know, what's the latest movies these days? Harry Potter's all been done now, hasn't it? Or, well, suppose the return of Harry Potter. If there was another really good movie on, would you have to say, oh, how can I keep my attention on this movie for an hour and a half or two hours? Is that a struggle at all? Well, how come when you're just watching your breathing for half an hour, how come that's a struggle? It's only half an hour, for goodness sake. The reason is because in the movie or in the football match or whatever, you have joy. It's fascinating, it's interesting for you. And that's one of the reasons why when you're kind to your mind, and you start watching it, it's, it's joyful. It's good fun to meditate, if you know how to do it properly. You added that kindness. If you are well, it's one of the workers for the Buddhist Society in Western Australia, I can see two of them here tonight, probably a few more, then if you receive kindness, if you deal with the people who come here with kindness, if you deal with all the accounts with kindness, it's much more enjoyable. And you do much better work as well, just the smile, the kindness, the joy. You're not just adding up figures. This is our Buddhist society. This is creating so much happiness and joy for so many people. And that's because of your help, answering all those emails. So whatever you do, if you can add the joy what you're doing, the happiness, wow! You mean I have the opportunity to work for the BSWA? I even get paid for it as well? Wow! I have the opportunity to fix up the camera, or it doesn't fix up, but you're trying the very best you can. Wow, what a wonderful way to spend an evening. And I mean that. Because what are you doing? <laughs> what you're actually doing is creating this kindness to yourself. And when you have that kindness to yourself, you find that is right in the center of our. Buddhist tradition. It is true that, you know, we have, and how can you actually be kind? You know, one of the ways to be kind, one of the most important parts of kindness, is actually when uh, you become more selfless. Have you ever noticed that the more selfish a person is, the bigger their ego, the more that they demand, the more that they need to keep that up their illusion of their self. But that stops people being kind. You, know, you have all those control freak um, bosses which people tell me about. You know, I, I've never seen those bosses. I admit that, because you know, I don't work in a company or corporation you just work in our Buddhist society, society, see other Buddhist societies, be with beautiful monks and nuns, and beautiful lay people. I don't know what you're like at work, but if you are kind, you'll find your business will always go far better. I can't imagine like a leader who is missing their kindness. And they cannot last for that long simply because for people to work together, I'm talking to work together, you do need that gentleness and kindness to bind you. I've seen that, look, our monastery down at Serpentine, we did another couple of ordinations last Wednesday. We now have uh, 24 monks at Serpentine, what I call four six-packs. <laughs> you put it in Australian terms. And we've got, I don't know how many nuns as well, we've got about 30 people in brown over in Serpentine. It's the most we've ever, ever had. I don't know how we can actually find a place to keep them all. But nevertheless, they're all welcome. And that's just the nuns as well we have. They're all growing. How come? 
how come it seems that Perth has got the, the, the biggest market share of monks and nuns? Honestly, we've got, this is by far the biggest monastery and for monks and nuns, certainly in Australia and probably most places in the world. How come? One of those reasons is because that's part of our practice, the kindness. To give that space to people. To teach when you meditate to be kind. Kind to your body and kind to your mind. To smile no matter what you're doing. Often when, say, monks do a job for me, they, they build a bridge or they, they um, make a wall. I will always tell them after the job is finished, that was a very good job. It was a very good job, I wasn't there to see it when you were doing it, otherwise I got very upset. <laughs> That's a joke, okay. <laughs> because to me, it's not the quality of what they produce, whether it's a beautiful building or a beautiful wall. What's important is the person enjoyed and gave as much as they can with all their effort. That to me is a good job. You know, one of the most beautiful gifts I've ever seen donated to a Buddha statue in Thailand. This story, it does make me emotional because I remember this, I saw it and it just really melted my heart. There was, I was cleaning out a hall as a young monk in Thailand, when I was just behind a cupboard and I heard someone creep in to our main hall. And straight away I thought, that must be a burglar. No one would just creep in like that. And I peeked and I saw, I recognized a young girl. She's maybe about 15 or 16 years of age and she was mentally disabled. But those people who were mentally disabled, you know, in those villages in Thailand, they were never put in an institution. They were part of the village. And they find their place inside that village. And this girl, all she could ever do was to grunt. She could not speak Thai. She went, uh, or uh. And every grunt had a different meaning. And all her friends who'd grown up with her, looked after her, been kind to her, they knew exactly what she said. It was like another language which hadn't been spoken before. A series of different grunts in different tones, different lengths. And that's how she conveyed her feelings to her friends. And it was her who came into our hall. And then she looked around, she never saw me. And she ran up to the, ma to the main shrine, a big Buddha statue there. She bowed three times quickly and put something on the shrine and ran out afterwards. She never ever expected that she was seen. And of course, I went up there afterwards and looked at what she donated. She had, with a piece of colored paper, folded it as best she could into like a origami lotus flower. And she offered it to the Buddha. She wouldn't offer it in front of any other monks because she'd be afraid it'd be thrown away. It was not the most artistic piece of work I'd ever seen. But I knew where it came from. How much effort, how much time, how much care it took this disabled girl to make that flower and put it on the shrine. And when I saw that, I told the other monks, I was not the senior monk in those days, I said where that flower had come from, and if anybody throws that away, <laughs> they will see the, I can't say violent side, but an angry side of Ajahn Brahm. That flower is going to stay there as long as it possibly can, especially out of respect to the person who gave it. That was one of the, some of the greatest gifts which I've ever seen. Not because it was worth anything in a marketplace, 
because I knew where it come from and how much effort and she put in just to make something like that. That's the kind of kindness I'm talking about. That is part of what we don't measure things in the same way as other people do. Just how can we be kind? How can we just be joyful? How can we share with other people? And so that kindness comes just the way we view things. I said when it's nothing about a self, not what I want, not what I need, not what I judge, but just how we can celebrate some of the amazing efforts which people do, which is much harder you know, to do than what I can do, like giving a talk. <laughs> I give thousands of talks. Almost every day I give a talk. I joke to the monks, if I'm not giving a talk one day, I'm sure I talk in my sleep. <laughs> I have to give a talk every day. <laughs> That's what I've been used to now. So, so, but nevertheless, someone who gives a talk, and they haven't given one before, Wonderful, not just monk or nun or lay person. Great, you're giving it everything you've got, well done. And praise them. That's what I mean by kindness. And one of the other things which I was talking about with kindness, some people feel they know what kindness is. Sometimes you can chant kindness, do the metta sutta, this is what should be done. But actually, do they practice kindness? Are you willing to drop everything you are doing to help somebody else who really needs it? Those spontaneous acts of kindness, I don't care who they come from, where someone drops everything. And this was a story of which somebody told me. I uh, met them again over in Thailand on this retreat that they had a very, very serious illness. It was actually malpractice by a doctor, they did it all wrong. And so they needed, the only place they could get it really fixed up was going to the United States, which was they didn't have enough money for that. They were in Singapore, and just one of the friends said, how much do you need? Oh, it costs about $10,000. He never hesitated. He just wrote her out a check for 10,000 Singapore dollars. She couldn't believe it. See, that was an act of kindness. Even here years ago, there was this Laotian lady. I figured out why she came here and why every, all her other relations were settled over in, I think, Washington State. You've got the same postcode, WA. I think that's all it must have taken. She was settled here in, in Perth and all her relations went to the United States. And if you know anything about, well even just Western culture, but especially Asian culture, your family is just so crucial to your well-being. And she could not, and she got this, this was those days when there was no, um, uh, like mail like we have these days, just send a text to somebody. She got this message in a, uh, they, what was it called, a telegram from her family over in Oregon, they were there then, that please come as soon as you can, your mother's very sick, she's dying. This was true. Her mother was old and was dying over in Oregon. She was here in Perth. She was young. She was fit, but she had no money at all. And so she was in that room over there crying in front of me. My mum is dying. I can't go and see her. What am I going to do? And at the same time that she was crying her eyes out in front of me, somebody else was arranging the flowers for the Friday night talk. And the reason why she was arranging the flowers that she was out of work, she was a, a nurse. She injured her back, she was trying to get some workers' compensation, hadn't got it yet. And 
she was looking at me and looking at this lady who was just crying her eyes out, trying to get a way to get to the United States. She took out her checkbook, signed a check, a blank check, and gave it to this Laotian girl. They weren't related. They weren't from the same country even. But they were Buddhists. She was a very kind woman. And she said, here's a check. Just go and see your mum. Left it blank. That's one of the most beautiful gifts I've seen because I knew her. You both people. And the lady who wrote the check, she wasn't wealthy at all. I don't know how she could even pay that. But she said she'll find a way. It was so important you know, that she could, she actually started crying even more then. Just the joy that she had a friend. Well, actually, she didn't really know her that well, but a friend who would support. Those are the beautiful acts of kindness which you see. Sometimes we don't, we don't, well, I celebrate them, I see them a lot. We don't actually put them in newspapers or anything. But they do exist. And when you do see them, wow. It just shows you just the power of that kindness. And eventually we do that with our meditation. It makes it so easy to be still, to be peaceful. So easy just to have amazing friends. That's the other thing which kindness does in any organization. Hopefully you know that you can trust everybody in these places. And please do that. As part of your training of being a Buddhist, or anybody, if you promise something, please try your very, very best to do it. It's one of the things Ajahn Chah told me. If you make a promise and you deliberately break it, it's like lying. You know, people think you're actually going to do something. If you don't, you're breaking your word. That is like lying. It's not a very nice thing that somebody lies to you. Have, you. have you ever known people you can't trust? Maybe they'll come, maybe they don't come. One of my old school friends came to visit me in Thailand. And I always mention to him one of the unmissable experiences of going to northeast Thailand. Just this old culture, had been there for such a long time was actually going on the morning arms round. The morning arms round, we'd walk quietly into the village and all these villagers would give us like a little piece of rice each, silently, but it was actually beautiful, a wonderful time of the day. People were getting up in the morning, people had come out to offer food to the monks. And you may think it's just begging, it's not begging, it's something much more beautiful than that. I remember one day that we were going out somewhere so we didn't go on our arms round that morning. And I thought, oh they'll be happy, they have more food today for themselves. No way. Later on in the afternoon they had a village meeting and the headman came, the big delegation of the senior people in the village. And those senior people in the village said, what have we done wrong? I'm sorry, why didn't you come on arms round this morning? They wanted to have the monks on arms round every morning. And they think they'd done something wrong, they never came that morning. It's a beautiful meeting. You know, of these renunciant monks, we were renunciant, we didn't have very much. And the villagers, who enjoyed just having their day start with this beautiful act of kindness. And anyway, I told my friend, you should actually come for one of these early morning arms rounds. It's unmissable. And what he said was, yeah, I'd love to come. What time does it start? Maybe about 5.30 a.m. 5.30 a.m.? I'd never get up that time in London. It doesn't matter, I'll be at your place at 25 past five, knock on your door. You don't have to wear much clothes to get dressed in Thailand that time in the morning. And so, of course I did that, knocked on his door at 25 past so he could just put on some clothes and then come on the arms round with me. And afterwards he told me, he said that was the weirdest feeling he'd ever had in his life. 
that when he went to bed that night, he knew I would be there in the morning to wake him up. He said in London he cannot trust anybody. Yeah, they say they're going to do this, but a lot of time they don't. But I was a monk, I was a close friend of his. He said, it was strange knowing that what I said I would do. And that's the amazing thing about when you have trust in this world. And hopefully each one of you can be kind enough to one another to have that trust. If somebody needs your help, it's an opportunity. Please give them that help. Be kind. I just think I mentioned earlier about you know smiling if you have an exam in the afternoon. You know, that was one thing I was a school teacher for one year. And that's one thing I really did not like about being a school teacher. It was setting exams. So I remember the time I did exams. Sometimes I knew the answer, I had a good brain. And my friend was sitting next to me say, he did not know the answer. And of course I wanted to help him, here's the answer. I don't want you to suffer. But you were punished for that, they call that cheating. That's not cheating, that's being kind. That's the way the real world works. If someone doesn't know the answer, you do, of course we share it. If you have ego and a sense of self, I'm not sharing anything, I did the homework, you didn't, so tough luck. That is awful, that's nasty. That's not the sort of world I like to live in. It's not cheating, it's sharing. <laughs> and that's of course what you do here. Everything which I've gained over all the years I've been meditating, all these great teachers I've been to, I spend every Friday sharing it as honestly, as much as I can with each one of you. What's the result? I'm not saying what it does to you, but it makes me feel just so energized, so happy. The more you give, the more you care, the more you're kind, the more spiritual energy you have. And if you've been really kind and caring and helping others, then don't waste that energy, just go and cross your legs and meditate, or sit on a chair and meditate. My goodness, I have some of the best meditations. When I've seen somebody else do a wonderful kind act, or done that kind act myself. Yeah, I may be tired. Yeah, I may be just been traveling all over the place. Nevertheless, he gets this beautiful energy up. That's something which people just miss out on. They think if you want really big energy, you have to go and take some drug, or just have a very strong cup of coffee, or you have to just, I don't know what you do to get energized in the morning. Imagine just smiling at yourself, giving the cat an extra bowl of milk in the morning. It's cold, the cat may not <laughs> talk about cats. There's one of the cats over in Bodhinyana Monastery, it's given a very original name, Kit Kat. Okay, it wasn't original at all. But that cat, I remember just waking up one morning, I used to get up at four o'clock, going out the door, and the cat was waiting right outside the door. It was one of those really cold nights in the forest. And as soon as that door was open, the cat went and ran into my room. I had a sleeping bag to keep warm. And it went right into the bottom of the sleeping bag where it was warmest. And then when I went back in, it refused to come out. <laughs> no way was it gonna come out. So we got my sleeping bag that morning. Fair enough. And I didn't feel cold, because I'd just been kind to a little cat who was feeling frozen. How can you feel cold? Never forget the power of that kindness. Yeah, I'm supposed to be talking about how that kindness is in the Eightfold Path. It's, of course it's in there, it's in right view when you're selfless. You live by kindness, that's how you 
you run a monastery with kindness, not with money, but with kindness, with a family. That's how you run a family. Your friends, you know, with kindness, that's the currency which runs any spiritual organization. And then, you know, we have that second factor of the Eightfold Path. And this is, the person who asked this question, it's in there and I, it kind of helped that I could see it in there. Part of actually what we do, the core teachings of meditation and Buddhism, of the, it's called Samasankapa, right motivation, where you're coming from. And the second of that is kindness. Renunciation, kindness and gentleness. If ever you see a monk or a nun who is angry, violent, they're breaking the Eightfold Path. They're not being gentle, they're being tough. They're not being kind. They're not just letting go of stuff. They're trying to accumulate stuff. That's not our path. And then of course from that, that's where we get, kind, we get the kind speech, kind actions and kind livelihoods. That kind speech is amazing. The results when you speak to other people with kindness. You don't complain, but you say it with kindness. And then it's amazing just how people want to look after you. Now when I was right in the middle of doing all this uh, building work, you had to go and visit shops to get things and I don't know how many times. And I used to go and get uh, plumbing stuff, for example. I used to go to Galvin's Plumbing and <laughs> Sometimes it's really big plumbers. I mean, they're really tough guys. And just in you know, their shorts and sandals and just in front of the... I remember one time I went there and as soon as they saw me coming into the shop, the people behind the counter, Bram, come over here. He was given VIP service. And all these Aussie plumbers, these big guys, the tough guys, you know, with shoulders as big as... Uh, uh, pickaxes, and his bodies as strong as you know, big septic tanks. <laughs> they were big and tough. They were looked at me, and I was a bit scared. I said, "No, come on over here, bro." I was giving VIP service, and I often wondered why. It's because you were kind to them. That's what happens when you're kind. You get priority service. Wouldn't you like to be? serving someone who's kind in your shop or in your company and they come in and they really are genuinely good kind people you want to trust them they're the sort of customers which they want no trouble at all so anyway that kindness works at all those levels. It is kind for your, to yourself. It's not just kind to others. Kindness to yourself. I started off with that, with just a little smile at yourself in the morning. This person who bears your name, the one you call you, well actually you call it me, don't you? Whatever it is, this person, you've got to live with this person for many more years. So aren't you going to be kind and nurture this person you call you? The one who bears your name? And what does that kindness mean? It doesn't mean improving yourself. Sometimes that's called curing the problem. And curing the problem often causes more problems than you ever think. You've heard me say this so many times, you don't cure the problem, you care for it. Remember I telling your son that years ago? That mum and dad were over the back over there. That was that doctor was about to resign. He lost a patient. And I told him, you missed the point of being a doctor. Your job is to care for your patients, never to cure them. Cure is a bit of an extra which may come but the care is most important. Then you're very successful. All those monks I've ordained at Bodhinyana Monastery, this one too, 
It's not about uh, making you enlightened. It's about caring. Caring for you as much as possible. Caring to be able to give you the opportunity to meditate. Caring you to give the instructions. Caring you to give you the time, the encouragement. And then all those amazing things in meditation, they work. To care, never to cure. To be kind. And when that kindness is there, <laughs> that's just so, so, so powerful. So kindness is there right from the beginning. And it's also in the last factor of the Eightfold Path, mindfulness. You can't be mindfulness without kindness. Say so the kindfulness. And deep meditation, my goodness. That deep meditation, the stillness, the last factor of the Eightfold Path, that is built on kindness, on the emotions, the joys which come up when you're kind to the mind. You're so kind to this mind that beautiful lights appear in the mind, you're still kind to them. Very often, I haven't got time to go into it detail now, but I'm sure it's online, you've heard it many times, to give the simile for meditation of the thousand petal lotus. How does a lotus open up? It has to receive the warmth and the light of the sun in the morning, and then the lotus opens up. You are that lotus to open you up, to see what's inside, the beautiful states of mind, the bliss, the joy, as you go deeper and deeper in. The beautiful lights are what we call the nimitas. Wow, they're gorgeous. Deeper into that, most happiness you've ever experienced in your life. That's right inside of you, right now. I don't exaggerate. You just got to open it out. How do you open it out? Using the warmth and light of the sun. The light of the sun, that symbolizes mindfulness. The warmth, the kindness. That's how it works. You can't have one without the other and have it effective. Never forget, if you're practicing a spiritual path, the importance of kindness. Sometimes people are just too hard. This is not the US Marines. We don't kick butt here. <laughs> if someone has a sore butt, you just give it some ointment or something. Give them an extra cushion to sit on. Give them a sort of a warm cushion to sit on if, if it's too cold for them. That kindness and the mindfulness is what actually empowers the meditation and takes it really, really deep. Okay, so that's a little talk today on kindness and its importance in Buddhism. So, uh, are there any questions? Question from Germany. A dog in a clinic abused me verbally till I cried in anger. But since it's better to make peace than to be right, I did nothing. A year ago, uh, I, I, am still ang I still am angry. What can I do? It's, don't let any person, when if they get angry at you, steal your happiness. It's, there's some things which you own. You may say you own them. It's a good way of looking at it your own inner peace and happiness. Don't let that be taken away by anybody who abuses you or even hits you. There's something inside of you which you keep. I'll never let anyone destroy the happiness and peace which you have. That's too valuable to let someone destroy. Yeah, they abuse you verbally. Why they do that, you don't know. But still, you can always walk out of there realizing you're not a victim. And if you can do that, you're not a victim, you're a victor. Dear Ajahn, if skills carry on from previous lives, what is the vehicle that it carries on through? Thank you, much Metta. The vehicle it carries on through is what we call the stream of consciousness. Look, you have like a river, like you know, the Swan River here, or the Canning River. And then that, it looks the same every day. 
but it's different water every day. The shape, the, uh, the beauty of it, what carries that from day to day? It's different water. But it's because it's in a certain channel and just the way that it uh, fits into the nature of all the hills and everything else around it, that that means that you, know, you can see its beauty, see what it is. That's what carries on from one life to another. It is the vehicle, don't even look at it as vehicle, I call it the stream of consciousness. That's how the Buddha explained it. And if that stream of consciousness is actually between these, uh, these banks of you know, a certain place, then it carries on that goodness. And if it flows peacefully, then of course it enriches everything around it. Next question from Kazakhstan. Where is the memory of past life is stored, given the brain is destroyed after death, and consciousness is just impermanentry momentary phenomena? The mind is impermanent momentary phenomena, but one mind moment just stimulates the next mind moment. That's why we call it a stream. So it's don't call it stored anywhere, to actually to let the mind be much wider than that. It's Memories of past life are real. That's why sometimes people can remember their previous lives. Or that sometimes you can contact your previous lives through meditation, or these days through hypnosis. But the meditation is far more powerful. So you ask, where can those things be stored? They're not stored, it's like you can access them. The idea of time, somebody asked me, can you talk about time today? If you start to remember past lives, you can actually start to see some of the illusion of time. It's not something which is so far away you can't touch. It's something you can touch in the spiritual world of meditation and stuff. What advice do you have for someone who has been betrayed by all her friends and rel relatives? You cannot choose new relatives, but certainly you can choose new friends. Not everyone will betray you. There's some really good people in this world. And so, you know, if you haven't chosen friends well or the friends have been dumped on you and they're not really good friends, it's amazing just how you can find new friends, maybe not new relatives, but you know, what is a relation anyway? Sometimes we call our relations loved ones. And you don't choose your relations, but you can choose your friends. So choose really good friends, kind friends. Friends who are actually there to help you, not just to be with you because they get something out of it. A good friend is someone who likes to give. Give time and then share a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever people like. And that becomes a really good friend. And betrayed by all your friends and relations is one friend you never need to be betrayed by and that's yourself. At the very least, be kind to yourself, be forgiving to all the faults you've ever done. And have this beautiful sense of warmth and kindness to this person you've known all your life. Yourself. You're not perfect, but you don't have to be, to be lovable. Okay, so that's the questions here. Are there any questions from the floor? Good old Eddie. Friday night would not be the same without a question from Eddie. No, it's nice. Yeah. Here we go. Ajahn Brahm, you yeah. give a very interesting talk about kindness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. While you're talking about kindness, I was thinking of Karma, no? karma. Yeah. Because kindness is a good karmic act, isn't it? It's a very wonderful karmic yeah. act. And and the opposite of um, uh, uh, kindness, unkindness, things like yeah. telling lies, pulling people down, yeah. you know, when all this propaganda, all, all yeah, yeah. So this acts of acts of kindness or unkindness, okay, Kar karmic acts, okay. Um, how do I say? The truth remains, you know. 
Okay, no. If you do good acts, okay, no one can pull you down. You know. Yeah. You act, you know. If you do unkind acts, all these things, okay, and the truth, you can't run away. Ultimately, the truth will come out. Yeah. You see what I mean, as well? It, sometimes it takes a time. I don't know why it takes such a long time. Mm -hmm. but it's wonderful you know, to uh, see acts of kindness. It's of ten acts of unkindness. They actually can be not so much healed, but the world gets brightened up by a good act of kindness. When you see and hear about good acts of kindness, that encourages more acts of kindness. There's a beauty and a richness in it, in a good act of kindness, which once you see and you touch, it's, you know, you want to repeat it. So that's one of the reasons why, yeah, sometimes you don't want to, or even like, for me anyway, punish acts of kindness. That gives them too much emphasis of unkindness, but just celebrate acts of kindness. Celebrate those and just, if you can, just ignore the other acts. But do you think, sorry, Ajabram, acts of unkindness, you can't run away from it, you know. Ultimately, the truth will come out. You might use the press or anything to, 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 yeah. book, to, to try to lie to, on your side, but ultimately, the truth will come out. You can't run away. The what truth comes out, yes. You're not running away. Mm. You're creating a much better world where people encourage kindness much more. Kindness, forgiveness, and there's so many of those stories which I remember, like Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, that story of that lady who found one of her torturers from Auschwitz and met up with her there, met, met up with him there, and said, in the middle of Auschwitz, there's one of these doctor's assistants who tortured her sister because they were twins. And then when they were there, that she said, I forgive you. The truth doesn't run away. But you can forgive the people who are stupid enough to do those stupid things. And that was just beautiful. It gives hope. Okay. So, I think... And I think that may be enough for today. Okay. Great. Okay, so now we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha if you wish. As you know, when I do that bow, it's to virtue, peace and compassion. I invite you to do the same if you wish. Hi, how are you doing?